ek is baie dankbaar dat hierdie jaar kan my kinders nou kinderkerk te gaan hulle alk wees, so dit is vir my amazing, <laughs> dit um, is rarig kruid, so ja, en dankie André vir die voorraag om te preek, um, dit is nie vir my klein ding om hier te staan nie, ek is, um, ek was gereed toe ek soos 12 of 13 was, en groot gedoop toe ek 13 was, en ek is lief vir die Heere en sy woord, en dit is rarig vir my groot ding om hier te staan, so dankie. Soos um, André gesê het, is ek getrouwd aan Kobus, um, wat jy hiervoor gesien het, as die twee klein kinders. En um, jy weet, dit is een amazing ding, maak jy sak hoe lang keer die Heere dien nie, as jy om nou vir week gedien het, en jy het een keer jou bybel gelees, of net een paar keer, of jy lees al jou bybel vir tien jaar, is daar altyd stikke wat challenging is, um, wat moeilik is. Daar is altyd stikke wat, as ons eerlik is, wil ons eindelijk net so of oorskiep, en aangaan. En as ons eerlijk is, is daar stikke waarmee ons nie saamsteem nie, maar ons kan nie dit rarig sê nie, ons, ons sê dit nie, want dit sal verkeerd wees, ons kan nie dit sê nie, maar dit is eindelijk wat aangaan, ons dink, ja nee, hierdie, ek weet nie van hierdie nie. Kom ek krijg skrif wat vir my makkelijk is, wat vir my mooi is, kom ek gaan aan. Maar ek weet dat die Heere se woord is lewe, die Heere se woord is, is joy en is vrede en is een beter pad, so as ek op die punt kom waar ek stikke kry wat ek dink, jo, en ek wil net aanbeweeg, dan moet ek aandag gee aan dit, want in spreke 14 sê die bybel, daar is een levenswijse wat vir een mens raag kan lyk, maar die uiteinde daarvan is die dood. In Johannes 14 sê, sê Jesus, ek is die weg en die waarheid en die lewe. The Lord wants to walk a road with us that leads to life. David writes in Psalm 139 verse 24, he writes and he says, kyk of ek op die verkeerde, kyk of ek nie op, op die verkeerde pad is nie, en lei my op die beproefde pad. Johannes 16, jy kan so lang in, na Johannes 8 toe blaai in jou bybels, want een groot gedeelte van my tekst gaan daar wees, in Johannes 14 sê, um, excuse, Johannes 16 sê, sê die Bijbel, wanneer hy kom, die geest van die waarheid, sal hy jylle in die jylle waarheid lei. And I just want to illustrate what that looks like, what that leading looks like, and I want to ask Henry and, Henry and Yannick, if they don't mind quickly, to just take a walk across the stage. I'm going to ask Henry to take Yannick's hand. I hope he warned you, Yannick. I asked him to. <laughs> just to come up onto the stage, just holding hands, and just take a walk across the stage. So they married, they're in love, and they're, just, they're going to hold hands and take a walk and hopefully not bump into anything. Kijk hoe gelukkig is hulle. Dankie julle. Well done, julle handeklap. Dankie. Julle kan gaan sit. Julle kan terugloop as julle wil. <laughs> so that's the picture the Bible gives us. That's the relationship he wants with us. To walk with us hand in hand. To lead us in the way of truth. The picture is not that God stands on the side and shouts, Hey, lach op jou bena, wat maak jy daar? That's not the picture. The picture is what we just saw there. Is God taking us by the hand and leading us in truth. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to walk with someone like that, that you love. When you're in love, you have time, you're both on the same page, um, you have mice nest, and you loop hand in hand, and you deal, and you praat, and you have relief. This is a wonderful thing. But how much more precious is it to know that God is inviting us, the God of the universe is inviting us into that relationship, to walk hand in hand with Him through life, as he leads us into all truth, as he leads us on the way that he wants us to go. I mean, that is an amazing thing to think, that that's what God wants for us, that that's by design, that's the life he's chosen for us, that we, could, we can know, we can have the peace and the joy um, and the hope to know that there's a God who's taking us by the hand and he's walking with us. He's not shouting at us from the sidelines, hey, I'm at sway, I'm at sway. He wants to lead us in all truth. It's a beautiful picture. In Amos 3.3, 3, the Bible says, How can two walk together unless they are agreed? Unless they are in agreement? 
Couples who are having a fight, and maybe you're like me in your marriage, but when I'm fighting with my husband, I'm definitely not taking a walk like Henry and Yannick did, holding hands. That's not how the fights look. <laughs> they look very different. That picture speaks of agreement. It speaks of two people being on the same page, being aligned, thinking the same, believing the same, um, aligned in their talking, aligned in their living. How can two walk together unless they are agreed? God wants to be in agreement with us. He wants us to be aligned with Him in our thinking, in our feeling, in our believing, in our living, in our saying, in our doing. By design, that's what He wants for us. You know, salvation is a line that you cross. On a day, you make a decision, you put your faith in Jesus, and you've crossed the line, you're saved. Praise God for that. But to walk in agreement with God is a lifelong walk, and it takes constant realignment. Just like in a marriage, you can't just get married and then carry on and think, so you share a house, you share a name, but if you don't, constantly keep realigning. Constantly keep coming back to each other and checking that you're on the same page, checking that you're still in agreement, checking that you're still believing, thinking, feeling, that you're still on the same page, you'll very quickly end up walking two different roads. And you can share a house, you can share a surname, but you won't be walking in agreement. And with God, it's the same way. The day we get saved, we cross that line, but then to walk in agreement in life with God and for Him to lead us in all truth, like the Bible says, we have to keep coming back and checking. Am I aligned? Am I aligned? Is what I'm thinking um, aligned with God? Is, is what I'm feeling aligned with His Word? Is what I'm believing aligned with what He says? Is, is how I'm talking and living? Am I still aligned with God? In John chapter 8, um, and if you're there, you can, um, you can go to verse 31. We're going to read from verse 31. John chapter 8 is, is one of those chunks of Scripture that are incredibly challenging. If you're someone who's not good with awkward situations, this will, this will make you uncomfortable. So I'm not good with awkward situations. If I was here on this day when this was playing out, I would have been saying, order, slick my in. I mean, it cannot get worse than this. So the context of John 8 is that Jesus is at the temple. It's church. Um, the Bible is very clear. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking, or not to Christians, but the Jews who believed in him. Speaking to people who believed in him. It's at church, in a church service. More than that, they're busy celebrating a feast that they've been taught to observe. So in some way, they're agreeing with God. They're aligned with God and his word because they're busy celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles which was um, given to the Jews to observe every year. And what it was is every year after the harvest, they would harvest their crops. And then God said to them, every year, once you've harvested your crops, set aside um, a number of days and come and celebrate the provision of God. So this is the context of this scripture. This is what is happening. There are people who believe in Jesus, who are sitting in church, who are in some ways are aligned with God because they're there to celebrate um, what he's called them to celebrate. These are people ce celebrating the provision of God. But the alarming thing about the scripture is now the provider is standing there at their celebration of provision. And they are so misaligned. They completely miss him. They miss what he's saying. They miss who he is. They completely deny him. And it, it just escalates to a point where they want to kill him and Jesus leaves. I mean, it sounds crazy. I want to read it to you. So Johannes 8, verse 31 af. Toe sê Jesus vir die jode wat in hom gloe, as jylle aan my woorde getrouw bly, is jylle waarlik my disciples. En jylle sal die waarheid ken en die waarheid sal jylle vry maak. Hulle het om geantwoord, ons is die nageslag van Abraham en was nog nooit iemands slave nie. Hoe kan jy sê, jylle sal vry word? Jesus sê toe vir hulle, dit verseker ek jylle, elkeen wat sonde doen, is een slaaf van die sonde. Een slaaf bly nie vir altyd by die huisgesin nie. Een seen bly vir altyd. Eers as die seen jylle vry maak, sal jylle waarlik vry wees. Ek weet, jylle is die nageslag van Abraham. 
maar jullie wil my dood maak, omdat my, woord, my woorde nie ingang by jullie vind nie. Ek praat oor wat ek by my vader gesien het, en jullie doen wat jullie by jullie vader gehoor het. Hulle het vir hom gesê, ons vader is Abraham. So, they are having two completely separate conversations, and it happens often in the Bible. Jesus is talking and saying one thing, and the people he's talking to are missing him completely and talking about something else. And that's what's happening here. And from, from this portion of scripture, you can go and read it. It escalates even more, because in the next portion of scripture, they go on to tell Jesus he has a demon. Jesus tells them that they are the children of the devil. I mean, it gets completely out of hand. And they actually end up wanting to kill Jesus because they cannot acknowledge who he is and they cannot agree with him on what his rightful place should be in their lives and what the rightful place should be of the word in their lives. So right at the end of that scripture, and you can go and read the whole thing, but it, it culminates and what happens right at the end of, of John 8 verse 56 Jesus speaks and he says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. They're saying, seriously, who do you think you are? And then Jesus says, truly, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Mic drop. (laughs) And Jesus walks away. (laughs) And it says this, and they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple area because it wasn't yet his time to die, so he just leaves. But it's an alarming passage of scripture. If Jesus is who he says he is, then his word is to be honored and accepted. And it's our responsibility to to align ourselves with him and his word. It's our responsibility to hear what he's saying, and no matter how challenging, how hard, how different it is from what's going on in our heads and our lives, it's our responsibility to align and to say, okay, God, I'm obviously on a different page to you, but God, I'm going to take your hand, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to let you lead me in this truth. Jack Hayford um, writes in in his commentary on John chapter 8, and he writes this, he says, it's not ethnic or family pedigree that makes us acceptable to God, but honoring God by believing in and loving Jesus. You see, these Jews on this day, they keep telling Jesus they're aligned with God because of who they are. They're aligned with God because they're in church. They're aligned with God because they're observing certain things that God told them to observe. They're observing the feast. They, they're ticking some boxes. You know, they know the pastor. They're on a first name basis with Andre. They go to cell group. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're not aligned at all. You are completely walking your own path. You see, a personal heart alignment is always required. We can never be acceptable to God by association. We can never be acceptable to God because of a seating arrangement. Oh, but we sat in church, so we're okay. It always comes down to personally in my life, in my walk with God, have I taken hands with Jesus and am I walking with him and am I allowing him to lead me in all truth? Or am I walking a different road? He's over there, but I'm over here. Maybe on one thing, maybe on many things. Am I aligned with God? I was reading the um, the children's Bible to my kids a while a while ago, and they're small; they're three and they're six. So um, it's a it's like stories and pictures, and it's very paraphrased. Um, and we were reading the creation story where Adam and Eve are in the garden, and Eve is telling the snake that she's not supposed to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. And in this children's Bible, they paraphrase it. And what the snake says back to her is, did God really say you shouldn't do that? And when I read it to my kids, I realized, shucks, that's exactly what it sounds like in my head. You know, you hear something from Scripture, and then I think, did God really say that applies to me? Did he really say it's it's for us now? Did God really say that this is for my circumstance, my personality? Did God really mean me to take it that seriously? 
Um, because the snake, you see, the snake says to, to Eve, he says to her, surely you won't die. It's not as bad as you think it is. Did God really say that? And often that's how we rationalize it in our heads. We hear something. We hear what the Bible says. We hear what God says to us. And then it starts, oh, did God really say, oh, you know, we don't want to be like extreme Christians. We don't want to be weird. <laughs> you know, it's only the BSN. Did God really say that? You know, it's not as drastic as picking up stones to kill Jesus like these Jews did. We think, yo, we're definitely better than them. Here we sit in church. We're all sitting. We're polite. We're orderly. They wanted to stone Jesus. But the end result is basically the same because we just crush the word in our lives. We hear it, but we, we squash it. We hear it, but we turn away from it. We hear it and we see Jesus saying it and saying, okay, I'm going to keep moving. And we just go, mm, I don't know. Doesn't sound right to me. Doesn't seem like a good idea. The Lord wants us to walk hand in hand with him. He wants to lead us into all truth. He wants to lead us in life, in joy, in peace. But for that to happen, we need to be in agreement. We need to align our thinking, our believing, our, belie our saying, our doing. And it starts with hearing what he says. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, hearing is actually the easy part. And I know we like to think that it's, it's difficult. We like to mystify it sometimes and think, oh, I don't know if I hear from God. I think Andre hears from God, you know, but I'm not sure if I hear from God. And I'm not making small of the fact that sometimes it is difficult to hear in a very specific circumstance where you may be trusting God for a decision about which job to take or, or what do I do here. That can be difficult. And, and then we have to really trust and pray and press in when we're looking for that specific direction. And even for me, it's the same. I, I'm praying about something right now and I'm going to spend a day or two praying and fasting because I, I need to be sure that I'm hearing the right thing. But 99% of the hearing is easy listening. Because we hear the word of God on Sundays. We hear it. We understand it. It's in a language that we understand. Apologies if the English is difficult for you this morning. But most of the time, Andre is preaching and then we hear it and we understand it. It's simple. We can pick up our Bibles. We can read it. Um, we're hearing the word of God. We can go to connect group. We hear the word of God. We understand what God is saying. And um, we can spend time with with spiritual believers, and then we hear the word of God, we hear what God is saying. Hearing is the easy part. The truth is, is that most of us have heard and understood much more word than we're agreeing with right now. The shortfall is normally in the agreement. So we've heard it. We know what the Bible says. We know what God says about certain things. We know what he says about family. We know what he says about duip, about baptism. We know what he says about marriage. We know what he says about sexual morality. We know what he says about the words that we speak about ourselves and about other people. We know. The issue is, are we agreed? Are we aligned with God? Are we saying, okay, God, I'm over here and I'm walking this road, but I see that you are walking over there on this issue. God, how do I get to you? How do I change my thinking, my feeling, my believing, my saying, my acting, my doing, so that I can take your hand again and walk with you, not walk apart from you on this issue. You know, some of us have very hard heads, and me included. I try and interpret the truth, you know. I try and um, rationalize it rather than obey it, rather than humble myself and say, okay, God, it's clear what you're saying. I need to get to you on this issue. <laughs> I don't need to try and get you to me and explain to you why you should be over here <laughs> where I am. I need to get to you. Maybe it's in general, some of us don't pay much attention to the Word of God. Maybe it's in something specific. Maybe it's on money or time or relationship or forgiveness or lust or discipleship or, um, or other Christians and how we interact with with them on, on baptism or what we say. Maybe it's on sexual morality. Maybe you're aligned with God in many areas. In many areas, you're, you're holding the Lord's hand and you're allowing him to lead you, but there's just something that you're just like, mm -mm. <laughs> I'm going this way. <laughs> but God is inviting you 
to take his hand, to align with him, to allow him to lead you into truth. Amos 3.3, Sal twee saamloop, as hulle dit nie afgesprek het nie. The Bible is very clear about God's desire to walk with you, to have that close relationship with you, holding you by the hand. Leviticus 26.11 says, I will make my dwelling among you. Imagine a king saying that to his people. Imagine a God saying that to average people like you and me. He says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. Deuteronomy 31 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We know the scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I sal jylle nie in die steek laat nie. Jylle nie alleen laat nie. Psalm 37 says, the psalmist writes and he says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken. That word forsaken is verlata. And it means that, it means to abandon, it means to desert, it means to turn away, to leave alone or to leave behind. And there are numerous scriptures where, where, where the Bible speaks in that context and God says, I will not forsake you. I have not forsaken you. I will not forsake you. I have not forsaken you. I will not forsake you. I have not forsaken you. I've not abandoned you. I've not left you behind. I haven't given up on you. I want to ask the band um, to come up this morning. There's a few contexts in which the word forsaken is used in the Bible. The one is that context where over and over again, the Bible speaks, or God speaks through his word, and he says, I will not forsake you. But there's another context where that word is used, in, used often in the scriptures in, as well. And the context of that is that God often says to his people, you have forsaken me. I've not forsaken you, but you've forsaken me. You've chosen to go your own way. You've forsaken my word. You've heard what I've said, you've understood it, but you've chosen a different path. You've abandoned me, you've left me, you've gone your own way. It comes up often in the Old Testament where God says to his people, I've not forsaken you, but you have forsaken me. And it speaks of that letting go of Jesus' hand and going in our own direction. There's one more context though, and it's maybe the most recognizable context in the Bible where, where the words forsaken are used, and we know the scripture because we've heard it so often, it's when Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he hangs on the cross and he cries out, the Bible says in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment on the cross, God abandoned Jesus to death so that you and I would never have to be forsaken by him. He did it like that so that he could, he could fill the scriptures with promises about him not forsaking us and it would have nothing to do with us. It's an amazing truth that because of Jesus' work on the cross, we are never forsaken. No matter how often we let go of God's hand, no matter how often we go our own, own way, no matter how bad the road gets that we choose away from his word, because of the cross, God promises, I will never forsake you. In fact, I can't. Because I forsook my son, I abandoned my son, so that I would never have to abandon you. The question remains for us, though, will we choose to abandon God? He sealed the deal. He'll walk with us. He'll take our hands and he'll lead us into all truth. He wants to have that relationship with us. Not where he's shouting from the side, but where he's walking closely with us. Two friends, two people who love each other, who care about each other and are, and are going somewhere that's good, going somewhere that's overflowing life, that's joy, that's peace, that's hope, that's a good path. The question is, will we choose to walk that path with him? A while ago, I was, um, I was bathing my kids and my oldest son was, I think he was about five at the time. And I don't know how, but he, he felt his heartbeat. He put his hand on his chest and he felt his heartbeat. 
And he said to me, what's that? <laughs> now I had to explain to a five-year-old, like, it's your pulse, it's the blood pumping. It's like difficult. <laughs> so I'm trying to explain to him, no, that's what, that's what that sound is. It's your heart beating. It's, you know, it's the blood moving. But he's like just looking at me. <laughs> and then when I'm done giving my best biology explanation, then he says to me, Oh, act all because this is what clock. <laughs> and I wanted to laugh because obviously someone has taught him that I think I get Jesus in my heart and gebed. Now klop om uit te kom. I don't know what he thinks. <laughs> you know, I stop burning and I klop the real time. Let me out. <laughs> but in his innocence, he just thought, no man, it's Jesus that's knocking. <laughs> And later when I put them to bed, I was thinking about it. And I went to go look for the scripture <laughs> that some Sunday school teacher had taught my child that gave him that impression. And the only scripture that I could find is Revelations 3.20. And it's often taught in the context of salvation. Um, that Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts to come in. But that's not actually what the Bible is saying in that context. So in Revelation 3, Jesus is writing to the church through the Holy Spirit, and he's warning them. It's the, it's the chunk of Scripture where he writes to the church, and he says, You have become lukewarm. Watch out. Otherwise, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And then he goes on to say in Revelation 3 from verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold... I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to dine with him and him with me. And again, this is a beautiful picture of God saying, this is the type of relationship that I want to have with you. A relationship that friends have. A relationship that people who are in agreement have. We don't invite people we don't like and we don't agree with into our homes to eat with us. We want to sit with our friends around the table, people who think like us, people who care about us, people who we are on the same page with. And Jesus is saying, this is what I want with you. I want to sit at your house in your table and eat with you and talk with you and be on the same page as you. I want to have that relationship with you. And I was thinking what, about what my son said. And then I realized it's probably truer than I realized when he said it, that the Lord's desire to come into that relationship with us is as constant as our heart is beating. If you would just listen to your heartbeat for a second and just imagine that with every beat, God is saying, can I come in? Can we get on the same page? Can we agree? Can I take your hand? Can we align on the things in your life? Can I lead you into truth? Can I be a friend to you? Can I lead you in the way of life constantly? As long as our heart is beating, God says, I've not forsaken you. doesn't matter what road you've chosen. As long as your heart is beating, he's knocking. With every heartbeat, he's knocking. Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? Can we get on the same page? Can we be friends? Can we walk this life together? It's constant. I want to pray for us this morning and I want to ask you just to take a moment to assess where you are. How aligned are you with God right now? Are you in agreement with God? Are you walking hand in hand with Him? Are you on the same page with Him? John 16, 13 says, this, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will lead you in all truth. The Bible says that when we get saved, we're filled with His Holy Spirit. So it stands to reason that you can't be led in this relationship with God. You can't walk hand in hand with God if you're not saved, if you haven't crossed that line. So for some of us, that's the first step this morning, to say, God, it sounds, it sounds like a life that I want, to be led by you, to walk hand in hand with you. But maybe you're sitting here this morning and you know that you've never actually crossed that line. You thought that you were acceptable by association. You thought you were acceptable by that seat that you're sitting in, by the family that you grew up in, but God is saying it's a personal decision. It's a personal walk. It's a personal choice to take his hand and say, God, I'm going to go your way. 
So I want to ask you to close your eyes just where you're sitting. And maybe this morning that's you. God is knocking. (laughs) He's asking. He's inviting you. And in a moment, we're going to pray. We'll pray at the end of the service. And I'm going to ask a number of people to come out if you feel you need prayer. Please be one of those people if you know you've never crossed that line before. If you've never stepped into that relationship with God. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you used to be aligned with God. You used to walk closely with Him. You used to give great attention to His Word and take very seriously what He said and what you heard in church, in cell, and and something happened. And you know that now you don't pay it that much attention anymore. You don't take it seriously. You dismiss it. And you have your reasons. We always have reasons for doing that. The Jews had reasons. Eve had reasons. But it doesn't change the fact that you are called to walk in agreement with God. He's not forsaken you. He's not left you. He's not given up on you, but he's waiting for you to say, okay, God, I'm going to come back and I'm going to realign my life with you. If that's you this morning, I also want to ask you at the end of the service to come out. Um, I'm going to ask the pastoral team, those of us who are praying this morning, to come and join me at the front. They'll be praying for people at the end. And then the last last thing is, is, is maybe for those of us sitting here this morning, you identify closely with those Jews. You believe in Jesus. You come to church. You're aligned maybe on many things. You've taken God's hand and you agree with Him on a, on a whole list of things, but there's something. It's not something out there that you're waiting for God to tell you. It's something that you know already. And right now, the Holy Spirit is probably reminding you of it, saying, it's that. You've let go of my hand on this issue and you've decided you're going to do it your way. But that way doesn't lead to life. His way does. And I want to challenge you this morning to say to God, okay, Okay, I surrender, (laughs) I give up my right to my opinion and my reason, and this morning I'll come into alignment with you, God. Maybe it's on baptism, then you should get baptized next Sunday. Maybe it's on money, maybe it's on sexual morality, maybe it's on what's going on right now in your marriage. Maybe in your marriage you're not aligned at all. I want to tell you that if you're not aligned with your spouse, you're not aligned with God. If you're living under the same roof and you share a surname but leading two completely separate lives, that's not alignment with God. Because marriage is His idea. It's His plan. It's His picture. So if we're not aligned with our spouses and we're sitting here this morning, that road leads nowhere good. And maybe for you this morning, that's the thing you need to acknowledge. And say, God, help me. Take my hand again and help me take the hand of my spouse and get aligned, get back on the same page so that we can walk a road together that leads to life. Whatever it may be for you this morning, would you say, God, okay, it's difficult. Sometimes the word is tough. (laughs) And sometimes we don't understand and we want to argue with it. But it leads to life. I'm going to pray for us this morning. Would you just bow your heads? Heavenly Father, God, we hear your word, Father. And we are so grateful that the God of the universe wants to walk in relationship with us, wants to take hands with us, wants to sit around a table with us. God, help us get to the table. Help us invite you in, God. Help us take your hand, God. Lord, I pray for people who have specific areas this morning where they need to come into alignment. And God, we know it's difficult. We know it's challenging. God, I pray that you'd help them. I pray that right now where they sit, they would make a decision, God to come back and take your hand. For marriages, God, that are on two different paths, God, two people who should be aligned but aren't, God, I pray that you would step in, God, in a powerful way. Take hands with them and put their hands back together again, God. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, God. We thank you for your love for us, God. We thank you that you're a good God who desires to walk a road with us. What a privilege, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Chrysler. I want to ask you, please come out for prayer. Don't leave if you need prayer. Otherwise, have a wonderful Sunday.